Greetings game developers! The time has come to build the ultimate pooling system in Unity. You guys like the ultimate event system, it forever changed how some of you develop games. Expect no less from this video, let's dive right into it. Here's what we're going to build. This is you, you are a cannon and you can shoot cannonballs. You have to hit those trolls hidden in barrels. When you hit them, they explode. That's it. So, we are spawning enemies, cannonballs and particles. All those are great candidates to be object pooled. And disclaimer, I misspelled cannon everywhere like a dumbass. Anyway, first of all, why is object pooling important? In Unity, instantiate and destroy are expensive methods. Instantiate is simply expensive and destroy is bad for the garbage collector. Garbage collection is necessary in C-sharp, we can't avoid it, but it can slow down your game and create random CPU spikes when you least want it. If the player experiences frame drops, during an intensive fight, be ready for some emotional reviews. For object pooling to make any sense, you need to have an object that you need very often and usually for a short period of time. Think bullets, bullet shells, bullet impacts, particle effects, enemies and so on. Shooting can really become a performance nightmare. Instantiate the bullet, instantiate the bullet shell, instantiate the hit particles. That's three instantiates and you shot once. Instead of instantiating bullets when you shoot and destroy them when they hit something, you create, let's say, 100 inactive bullets. You keep them ready in a pool. Whenever you want to shoot, you take a bullet from the pool, you configure it and then you shoot it. Then instead of destroying the bullet, you deactivate it and throw it back on the pool. The configure step is really important and that's the secret to good object pooling. Once you fall in love with object pooling, you will never spawn game objects the same way ever again. But there is one challenge that will hit your object pooling dreams really hard and will haunt you. The problem is about the granularity of the objects to pull. Let me explain. If you need something small and general many, many times, like a bullet, this is trivial. Get a bullet, use it, put it back on the pool. But if you need something big and complex many, many times, like enemies, loot crates, or even power-ups, you might have 10 or 20 different types of enemies, each with their own models, textures, weapons, and abilities. How do you object pool this? Option one, you create one pool per enemy, so you get the enemy and use it directly. This results in many pools, and you will most likely end up with a dictionary mapping a key to a pool. Option two, you create one pool of a generic enemy and configure the enemy object when you need it. This means that the enemy prefab needs to have everything to be able to become any type of enemy. All right, that's for the explanation. There are no silver bullets here. One way or another, you will have to compromise. Now, for an ultimate video, I'll show you three ways to do object pooling in Unity. And at the end of this video, you will know everything you need to reuse that system or build your own. Because remember, no silver bullets. Let's now get to work. Here's a starting scene with some small environment and some models. By the way, you can download those models I made, the link is below. There is also some of the source code, which I recommend you don't copy and paste if you are here to learn. All right, after some basic setup, there is a cannon. It is rigged and has the muzzle at the right place, as well as some particle effects. The animator is very simple. It transitions from idle to loading and back using a boolean called loading. There's a spawn location where enemies will spawn. The cannonball has a sphere collider and rigid body. The collision detection is set to continuous dynamic because in my version, the ball is pretty fast and this improves the accuracy of collisions. I froze the rotation for ease of use, but you could also not do it. Finally, the enemy, it's also rigged and has some accessories like spikes and a pack of dynamites. And it also has two animations, idle and walking. Now, nothing else is done. We have to code all. So let's create a scripts folder. And inside I will create a C-sharp script called cannonball. We will first implement the game using instantiate and destroy. And later we will refactor it. That way you will understand how to refactor your own project, hopefully. The two main fields are destroy after that we will use to destroy this ball after five seconds. Hit VFX will be the explosion that we spawn when this ball touches an enemy. We get the rigid body reference in awake and in start we can directly schedule the destruction of this object after the delay. Then this ball is pretty dumb. It won't decide when to be thrown or explode. Another script will tell it that. So 
We have two public methods. Hit will spawn an explosion, schedule the destroy of that explosion game object. And here I forgot to put dot game object, sorry for that. And since explosion spawned, we can destroy the ball directly. The throw method will just take a force vector as input and apply it on the rigid body. Save, put the script on the ball, and either you create a new particle system or use an asset. I have downloaded one casual VFX pack and I will use that one. The cannonball is ready like that. We can make a prefab out of it and move on to the cannon. The cannon has an animation for shooting and this animation has an event called shoot. This will be our signal to spawn the cannonball. So the shooting is mainly animation driven. Let's make the cannon script and put it on the cannon. The base code is simple. We need a reference to the cannonball prefab, a reference to the muzzle transform. Then we have the shooting for the delay after which we can start shooting when the game starts and the rate at which we can shoot. Finally, we also have a reference to the muzzle flash and in a way we get the animator and for maximum performance, we can convert the animation parameter name from string to an int and use that field instead. I prefer this than risking to type two times the same string. Can you imagine the horror? In update, and I assume you did this at least once before. We check if we can shoot and we check if the player clicked on the mouse. If yes, we update the timer and call prepare to shoot. This method could do more, but for now it's just start the animation. I simply like organizing things in methods early on. And remember the animation event calls shoot. So in that method, we change the loading parameter back to false and instantiate a new cannonball. We apply some force and play the muzzle flash. Save, and in Unity we put the cannonball prefab in place, the muzzle into the muzzle slot, shooting force at 25, delay at two, rate at one, and link the flash VF. Let's try it out. No surprises here, we spawn cannonballs and they destroy themselves after five seconds. Let's work on the enemy. I will make a new enemy script and put it on the enemy. The enemy is super basic. It will just go forward, which is pretty realistic, considering that the thing inside does not really see where it goes. I challenge you, try to act smart while walking a barrel. Or maybe just like and subscribe this video. That's also fine. Super quick. We get the references, we move forward using the velocity, and when we collide with the cannonball, we tell the ball that it got a hit and we explode. This means for now that we destroy the game object. Let's try it out. Okay, that's way too fast. Maybe a speed like 0.5 is fine. I also remove the sphere trigger that I had for some reason. I'll actually not need it. And let's make a prefab out of it. Last script before we move to object pooling everything. I'll create an enemy spawner and put it on the spawn location. Unity 101. We take a prefab, we track a timer, and we spawn the prefab after every x seconds. That's all. Very simple, very inefficient. In Unity, drag the enemy prefab in place, set the delay at 1 and the rate at 2 for example. And that's it. We are ready for phase 2, finally. Alright, here's a quick plan of what we are going to do. We will apply object pooling on the enemies, on the cannonball, and on the cannonball's explosion. Each time, we will do a different implementation. Let's start simple with the enemy spawner, make a new script called poolable enemy spawner, and put it on the spawn object. I'll copy all the content from the enemy spawner in it, and we will start from there. At the top, import unityengine.pool, then add a private object pool of type enemy, and call it enemy pool. And in a way, we have to create the pool. The white text is simply the named arguments. You can leave them out, but I like that it's super explicit and easy to read, at least for the first time. We have to define methods when the object is created, when we take it from the pool, when we release it, and destroy it. We can also give an initial pool capacity. Let's Let's go over the object pool methods one by one. To create new objects, of course, there is no avoiding it. We are using instantiate. We create a new enemy, keep it inactive and return it. This method is called whenever the pool is empty and we need a new enemy. Now, once the pool has objects in it, the take from pool method is called whenever we get an item from the pool. Here we simply activate the enemy object. On enemy destroy will not be called here, but let's define it. As I understand from the documentation, this will only be called when you call clear or dispose on the object pool. This is useful when you switch scenes and you know you don't need anything that you have pulled before. Finally, on enemy release is called whenever an object is put back into the pool. Here, you want to deactivate the object, unsubscribe from any event, and so on. The methods are all ready. Now refactor the spawn code to use the object pool. Instantiate takes a position and rotation. Object pool get does not. 
So we have to get the object and do our changes afterwards. Since this video is about performance gains, let's push the optimization further. Getting and setting transform.position and then transform.rotation is apparently not efficient as the C-sharp code has to switch four times to native code. This is why there is a get position rotation as well as set position rotation method. You then have two times less round trips to the native code, whatever. If you test this now, it works, but it's not done yet. We have to refactor the enemy class uh, as well. Right now, the enemy destroys itself when it gets hit. That's a no-no. Now, there is an object pool in play. One solution is to add a delegate, for example, an unity action on death. And instead of destroy, we invoke that event. What this solution does, it completely removes the creation and destruction of the enemy from the enemy class. Now, in the spawner script, we have to register a method to the on death event. In this method, we don't destroy, of course, we release the object. It goes back to the pool and on release we unregister from the event. The enemy has zero knowledge about the pool. That's not bad. All right, let's try it out. Enemies are spawning and get inactive when hit. The magic of object pooling is that any inactive object is then directly reused when the next one spawns. Perfect, highly efficient. Oh, and now they are confused. I show you this on purpose. Do you know why this happens? We are reusing enemies. Those are rigid bodies with velocities and angular velocities. In our code, we are taking care of the velocity, but not the angular velocity. This means that what seemed to be a new enemy still has the effects of whatever happened before. So when you do object pooling, you have to think about properly resetting the state of the object. Now let's talk about configuration. We don't have one enemy. We have enemies with and without spikes and with and without dynamite and we could have even more variations. Let's use some scriptable objects and enums to make a simple configurable enemy. I'll create a new script called enemy config so. Then first we go into enemy and I will add two new blocks. First an enum item category and second a standard C sharp class with inside a public item category and public game object. Save and open the enemy prefab. The enemy setup is simple. We want to link an enum to a game object. Next, the enemy config so will simply hold a list of item categories. Done. Next step is to add a configure method in the enemy script where we can, for example, reset the velocity and other things. I convert the configuration received as parameter to a hash set of enums and this could have been done once in on enable of the scriptable object actually. Lastly, we loop over our configuration and enable only the one that matches. All right, someone needs to give the enemy the configuration and that someone is a spawner. So the spawner will have all enemy configurations. In spawn, it will randomly choose one configuration and tell the enemy to configure itself using that data. Before we can test, we need to create some scriptable objects. I'll create uh, four enemies, one with nothing, one with dynamite, one with uh, spikes, and one with dynamite and spikes. And we put them all in the list on the spawner. Now each enemy is randomized with a configuration. Awesome. One object pool can create different types of enemies. As you can imagine, we can push the customization really far. All right, that was the first implementation. Pretty straightforward. Just use the object pool directly in your manager class. For the next implementation, we are going to put an object pool in a scriptable object. Create two new C sharp scripts, an object pool SO, and an I poolable. The structure is like this. The scriptable object has a pool and objects that we put in the pool can implement the I poolable interface. This means that the pool can be used for any kind of objects and you have the option to customize how each object behaves during the different pooling lifecycle methods. The interface is going to have five methods. Register pool with the object pool SO as parameter and the create, take, release, destroy methods. The object pool SO is a scriptable object. We need to put some public fields, one for the prefab, the default capacity, and the rest is a little nice to have. I use that to offset the default spawn position and rotation of the object. Like maybe you want to spawn your things very far from your main world or for whatever reason. Then we define the object pool of game objects and we define each method. Now this should not be special to you anymore. In create we instantiate and return the object. What's new is that we try to get the iPoolable component and if that works we register this as a pool and call on pool create object. Maybe that object will run some extra logic. The same in on take from pool we check if we can use the iPoolable interface. On return pool we do that before and then we deactivate the object. Same with destroy. The last two methods are public, one to get and one to release. This is how we use that object pool as well. What is missing is to force the full clearing 
of the object pool. Since now we have an SO, multiple scenes in your game could use the same pool. So when you are switching scenes, you might want to either clear all the pooled objects and restart, or you move those objects to the next scene. Keep this in mind. In Unity, let's create a new object pool object, and let's drag and drop the cannonball inside. Next, we have to update our cannon and our cannonball script. In Canon, we need a reference to the object pool SO, and then in Shoot, instead of instantiate, we have to get an object from the pool, set its position, and and rotation and since we expect a cannonball we can get the component and we will configure the object and call throw. In the cannonball script we should implement the iPoolable interface and keep a private object pool SO field. What's important is that we have to remove the destroy statement from the start method. Except register pool we don't really need the other interface methods. The new configure method will reset the velocity and for the sake of this tutorial we will invoke release later. This is not pretty but it works. Release is our new destroy method for the cannonball. We cancel all invocation, I will tell you why in a second. And since we know the object pool, we release ourselves. In hit, instead of destroy, we call our new release method. And this is why we cancel invocation. Since objects are reused, if we don't do that line, we might pull a cannonball that as soon as it becomes active, the scheduled invoke kicks in and automatically releases the ball. <laughs> you don't want that. So maybe you can implement a time to leave timer for auto releasing the object. It might be cleaner. The setup is easy. We drag and drop the scriptable object on the slot of the cannon. All right, it works. Cannonballs are now part of the pool party. This implementation is awesome because you can give the same object pool to multiple objects. Everyone who needs a cannonball, here you go, use this pool. All right, are you ready for the last implementation? Remember, no silver bullet, we're exploring multiple ways to do the same thing. Our last implementation is called Super Object Pool SO. Because I prefer this one over the previous one. Interfaces are nice, but if you implement I poolable a lot, you will start having repeating code. So we create a new super object pool SO that is obviously a scriptable object. And we create an abstract class poolable mono behavior. Everything should be familiar, it's just slightly different. We have an action on release that can be used by other scripts to get notified when this object gets released. We have the register pool method with the references to the pool. The object has a public release method to release itself and invoke the event. And finally, we have some virtual methods that the concrete implementation can override. I don't use the on post get in this video, but this is just to show you some ideas. Maybe you want to perform some action after the object has been taken from the pool, like really as a last step. The super object pool SO is very similar to the object pool SO. The difference is that it uses a poolable mono behavior everywhere. So we know what we have and we can call all methods directly without trying to get a component. If you understood the previous implementation, this one is working the same way. All right, we will use this pooling technique on our hit VFX object that is being used in the cannonball script. This means that we need a super object pool SO and we have to change our hit method. Now, poolable mono behavior is abstract. Hit VFX will implement its own class and if we want, we can cast it to a pooled particle system, for example, that we will create right now. That class looks like this. It has a reference to the particle system and we hook into the stop action callback to get notified when the particle system has finished and we call release. Release comes from the poolable mono behavior. All right, so cannonball needs a super object pool. Let's create one. Your particle system prefab will need to have the pooled particle system mono behavior on it. Now we can put the prefab into the super object pool and put the object pool on the cannonball. All right, there you go. Three different ways to use Unity's object pool directly in your class as a scriptable object with interfaces or as a scriptable object with an abstract mono behavior. I know, I know. You can push the abstraction pretty far but I've tested also other variations and came to the conclusion that Unity's object pool is pretty abstract already, right? Pushing the abstraction too far can be counterproductive and you might end up with an abstract object pool factory builder. Just saying, be careful out there. With all that being said, thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked this video. Now go work on your game and I'll see you next time. Oh, by the way, we have a Discord community. You can join the Game Dev Kingdom. The link is below in the description. We have fun and we discuss Unity stuff a lot. As you can see, this is a, a new setup. It's not a new setup. Normally the camera is behind me, pointing in this direction. Now I just sit at the desk, put uh, the green screen behind, and uh, it's faster to record. I think it's so much faster. Now I understand why everyone is sitting at their computer 
and just talking straight to the camera, straight in the mic, everything is ready. I think I'm going to use this for a while. 